Good morning. I uh, am really enjoying John chapter 15. It is so, so rich, this word picture. Can you, uh, can you turn that down in the monitor just a little bit? I got, it's echoing like crazy. It's because I just turned that monitor back around from before. Thank you, man. Um, yesterday, I spent about 10 hours up here at the church. I was telling James, working on verses 7 through 11, these five verses, 10 hours, and it felt like 30 minutes just in the Word. And uh, I hope that this Word today brings as much joy to your hearts and minds as it has to mine studying it. So let's look together at John chapter 15, verses 7 through 11. Jesus says, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. And by this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your life-giving word. I pray that as this is unpacked today, that your spirit, Holy Spirit, would apply it to our hearts and minds, that we would be gripped by your word, that it would change us and cause us to be conformed to your image, Jesus, for the sake of your glory. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus, since chapter 11, has been pouring out his instructions. He's been pouring out his, his, sorry, since chapter 13, has been pouring out his instructions and his promises, promise after promise, as we've been progressing through this account of Jesus alone with his 11 disciples. And as they depart the upper room uh, where they had their last supper with Jesus at the end of chapter 14, they begin their walk to the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus will be arrested only moments from the time in this scripture before us today. Uh, Jesus gives to his disciples a word picture. Uh, What we're seeing in the opening of chapter 15 really is a, a word picture. He's drawing a picture using his his words. As the disciples know very well, the vineyard and the operation of the, the vineyard. Vineyards were a, uh, uh, a, a common thing. The production of grapes for making wine was a mainstream business in this area in this day. And so Jesus uses this picture of the vineyard to teach his disciples, saying that Jesus, who is God incarnate, He says, I am the true vine, right? He is God wrapped in human flesh, is the true vine. And God, the Father, is the vine dresser. It is the Father's vineyard. Uh, The Father owns the vineyard. He is the owner. He is the caretaker. All the glory of the fruit that the vineyard belongs to the Father who owns it all and who cares for His vineyard. Jesus is the life-giving vine that the branch must be connected to in order to bear fruit, right? Jesus is the true vine. The believer is likened to a, the branch, right? The Father is actively tending to the branches, lifting them up and pruning them in order to increase the fruit of the branch. This is like the process of sanctification in our lives as, as, uh, as believers, as we grow in the grace of God, becoming more like Christ throughout our days, God is continually pruning us, which sometimes hurts, right? And, and, and which many times looks like affliction, but ultimately is conforming us more and more to the image of Christ. 
There are branches that are in Christ that God tends to. There are branches that are taken away. There are some dead branches, some withered branches on the ground, and they are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. We see the picture of this in Jesus' parable in Matthew chapter 13. If you're not familiar with Matthew chapter 13, you should, should read it. A lot of good parables, and Jesus explains what he's saying. There's a parable of four types of soil. Only one of those is good soil. And when the Word of God comes, it, it, it's, it's the good soil that brings the fruit. There are some that look like uh, that, that it, it begins to sprout and that it, it dies. In the end of chapter 13, he gives another parable about a thief who comes and sows weeds among the wheat or tares among the wheat is what he says. And, and, and so what that is a picture of are those who are bad branches. They look like they're a part of the church, but they're a weed. There is no life in them. And Judas is Judas Iscariot is the kind of the prime example of this. Um, Judas looked the part. He he had them all fooled, but Jesus, he was a lifeless branch. Jesus revealed this in chapter 6 and in chapter 8. And in 11, we see the fulfillment that Satan entered Judas Iscariot and he went to betray Jesus. So there is the father, the vine dresser, Jesus, the true vine. There are branches and there is fruit. There is fruit. God is glorified in the fruit of the vineyard, which is the work of his hands through the vine Jesus, which is the life giving sap that comes to the branches, causing the branch to bear Christ's fruit for the father's Glory, as we learned last week from Pastor James, it is, it's Christ's fruit as His life causes us to bear fruit. It is Christ's fruit. So the word picture here that Jesus gives to His disciples and to us is a picture of what it looks like to live the Christian life. This is a picture of what it looks like to live the Christian life. The, the, the word picture here should really be our worldview our scriptural worldview. The Father is the vine dresser. This goes back to Genesis 1 in creation, right? Um, the answer to the catechism, Westminster Catechism, who is God? He is, the, he is the creator of everyone and everything. God permitted that the serpent could tempt Adam and Adam disobeyed God and with his sin, the garden of God and the earth was closed up and the sin of the one man brought sin into all the earth. Man and the serpent, the earth were cursed. Therefore, because of that, we are all born in sin. We are all born under Adam. But God gave a promise through Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, Moses, Joshua, David of rescue. For God's elect, all whom were foreshadows of the promised Messiah who was to come, the man, Jesus Christ, who is the true vine and the final rescuer. To all who abide in Him, who remain in the true vine, these are the ones who have been granted eternal life. These are the ones in whom God has set His love upon from the foundation of the world and set apart for such a time as this to bear much fruit, bringing glory to the Father in this really dark world. And so today we pick up in verse 7 through 11 and we see the benefits, the benefits of abiding in the true vine. As a believer, we live for one thing and that is to bring glory to the Father. Our life should be about nothing more. Whatever it is we do, it should be to the glory of the Father at the forefronts of our hearts, our minds, and the benefits of salvation, the benefits of abiding in the true vine are as we see in this verse. In verse 7, we see the promise of answered prayer. In verse 8, we see that we have a blessed assurance of salvation. In verses 9 and 10, the promise of bountiful love. And in verse 11, the promise of great joy. So let's look at verse 7, the promise of answered prayer. He says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. 
ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Jesus gives the promise of answered prayers. However, there is a prerequisite. There's a prerequisite. If you abide in me and my words abide in you. If if you abide in me, Jesus says, to abide in Christ means to keep up a habit of constant, close communion with Christ. Right? We've we got to be walking with Christ. To abide in Christ is close communion with Jesus. To, to abide in Christ is to always be leaning upon Jesus. It, it is to pour out our heart to Him. It, it is to rest in Jesus. And it's using Him as our fountain of life and strength. He is to be our chief companion, our best friend who is closer than a brother. Does your relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ look like that kind of close communion? He says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, to have his words abiding in us is to keep his sayings, to keep his teaching, to keep his precepts continually before our minds, our memories, to make them the guide of our actions and the rule of our daily conducts and life. This is a, the word abiding in us. And so through that lens of us abiding in Jesus, His word abiding in us, how does that change prayer, right? Jesus, or, or Paul tells us, no, I'm sorry, James tells us in James 5, 16, therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. I like the King James version of this. Um, for the fervent, effectual prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So fervent, effectual prayer comes from abiding in Christ from close communion with Christ, leaning on Him, trusting in Him because He is our source of life. He is our source of life. And fervent, effectual prayers are rooted in the Word. We know the revealed will of God because He has given His Word and we are to pray according to His will, to His Word. Jesus is, remember, about to Leave the disciples here. Uh, think of what must be going through their minds as Jesus says these words. Jesus has come doing only what the Father has shown Him to do, and they have witnessed it. He has performed many signs and wonders, verifying His claims to be God in human flesh, the promised Messiah. He has preached concerning the kingdom of God and the age that is to come, the age in which we now live, the church age, which is the ordinary means of grace, are expressed through His church. This age where salvation comes through Scripture alone, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, to the glory of God alone. These disciples were used to Jesus doing the work. Uh, these disciples, he, he, he was there to teach them, to answer their questions, but soon he would be gone and his disciples would become the light of the world. He's teaching them that if you are in me, if, if my words are in you, if you are truly about the Father's glory, unlike Judas Iscariot who was about his own worldly power and riches, but a genuine born-again believer seeking always the glory of God and love slaves to the Lord Jesus Christ. Ask anything and it will be given. Jesus is going away but sending another in His place, the Holy Spirit, to empower His disciples to live righteously and bear fruit, to proclaim the excellencies of Christ in the world. The disciples can now... for. Uh, can now know for certain that whatever they ask, as they are commissioned in Acts 2 to, to, as apostles to establish the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, that their prayers will be answered according to the will of the Father. The task that is before them is big. And the, Jesus is about to leave. And they have the comfort of knowing that whatever, so, whatsoever they ask, abiding in Christ, His Word abiding in them, 
that Jesus will do for them. But, so, what does that look like for us? How do we pray? What does it look like to pray abiding in Christ, His Word abiding in us in a manner that our prayers will be answered, right? The Lord gives us an example of how we are to pray. And in that example of the Lord's Prayer, it begins with the holiness of God, right? Hallowed be your name. God is holy. God is set apart from all others. Uh, Everything belongs to God. The earth is His and the fullness thereof. We pray acknowledging the holiness of God, right? How do you view God? Is everything the Lord's? Is, is, does your income belong to you or is it God's gracious gift to you that you may steward it for the household that He has put you in? Does, does your home belong to you or was it graciously given by God as a shelter from the physical storms of life? How do you view God? Is He holy? He is holy. And in prayer, we acknowledge His holiness. We are to actively commune with God. Right? He says, the Trinity, we learned in chapter 14, dwells within the believer. We must talk to God as we go about our day. We are, as believers, to be in constant communion with the Lord. We are to be in constant state of prayer. 1 Thessalonians 5, Paul says in verse 16, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. We are to pray without ceasing. Jesus goes on to pray in his model prayer, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We are to pray this way, right? for His kingdom to come and His will to be done, which is fitting for Jesus' words here concerning His Word abiding in us. To pray the will of God, we must know the Word of God. We no longer have a will of our own. We are connected to the true vine. His will has become our will. We seek His will. We seek His will. That is our aim. The prayers of these apostles he is promising to answer are concerning the foundation of the church that will be built. They are concerning Christ's church, and we must have a right view of Christ's church. We must remain in consistent communion with the Lord in prayer as we walk through this life. And our prayers must be according to His will, according to His Word. Many take this verse way out of context. Way out of context. I grew up in a Pentecostal church, and I've never actually heard this verse in, a con- in context, right, um, growing up. This, 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 it, it, I'm sure you've seen it. If I were to pray for a million dollars, it would bring nothing but self-satisfaction and would cause my fruit to rot. Many people make this out to be whatever you ask for, he, he will give. No, there's a prerequisite. Are we abiding in Christ? Does our prayer come from a place of truly abiding in the vine, the life-giving source who is Jesus Christ? Is, is His Word abide in us? As we read the Scriptures, Does it change us? Is that the lens by which we pray? We pray, gazing into the holiness of God, asking for His purpose in the earth to come to pass in our lives, that He would cause us to bear fruit for the sake of His name and glory, even at the expense of the pain of pruning that He brings to us. Verse 8, we see the blessed assurance of salvation. And by this, 
My Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. The Father is glorified as we bear much fruit. The word glorified in the Greek word in the Greek is does doxazo, and it means to think, to praise or magnify, to honor or hold in honor, to make glorious. This is what the fruit of the branch does. It, it magnifies the Father. It honors the Father. I like this word, honors the Father. God is glorified in our fruit in the same way that a father and mother are honored as their son advances before them, say at a restaurant, and opens the door and holds the door open as they pass through, and it exposes the fruit that you've instilled in your children, and it brings honor to mom and dad. You listening, Jax? It brings honor to your parents when you hold that door open and show respect. And the, your parents have a glory for that, right? The father is glorified by the fruit of his children, by the fruit of the branch in the same way. If you'll notice, we went from fruit in verse 2 to more fruit, and now we see much fruit, much fruit. So it is in the life of the believer as we grow up in the grace and knowledge of God, we bear more and more fruit, thereby we glorify the Father more and more as we progress in the Christian life, right? The biggest question for a believer is, how do I know if, if I am really in the faith or not, though? How can we know if we are truly saved, truly born of the Spirit? And we do have a blessed assurance of salvation. Listen to this. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my Disciples, there is proof of salvation and it is the fruit that we bear because of Christ. He says, so prove to be my disciples. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Or do you not realize this about yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you fail to meet the test? So how do we examine ourselves, right? How do we Prove to be Jesus' disciples. We examine our fruit. The fruit of the branch is the glory of the Father and only comes through abiding in the vine. Uh, apart from the vine, we can do nothing, right? If there is fruit in our lives, it is assurance of our salvation and eternal hope. There is the inward fruit of Galatians 5, 22 and 23. The fruit of the Spirit that the Spirit produces in the believer. Uh, there is upward fruit, the praise and adoration as we lift high the name of Jesus and praise and, and, and worship to our great God. And there is outward fruit that is good works. The result of the inward fruit moves out of us into good works in Christ. All of this fruit comes more and more as we are conformed to the image of Jesus, right? Romans 8, 28, and we know that for those who love God, this is those who really love God, who are in God, who are abiding in Christ, those who love God and all things work together for good. This all things encompasses everything, good, bad, and ugly. Anything that would come into your life, God says is good because He has brought it there. For those who are called according to His purpose, for those who He foreknew, that means foreloved, loved before the foundation of the world, He also predestined, determined before time, for you to be conformed to the image of His Son. That's our aim. That's what God is doing in the life of every believer. He is conforming us to the image of His Son in order 
that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and those whom he predestined. He also called and to those he called at the appointed time, he justifies. And those whom he justifies, he also glorifies. Our salvation is secure in Christ. Bearing fruit looks like becoming conformed to the image of Jesus. Think about that, coming conformed to Jesus. When Dusty and I got married, we were love blinded, just like every one of y'all that are married are, right? We're all like that, giddy. You think you really know a person and then you live with them in the same house and realize quickly you're different people. And we all go through this when we're first married. It's joyful. We realize we're different people. As time goes on, my wife has become like me and I have become like my wife. Our lives have molded together. They have blended together. Uh, the, the, the best of her and the best of me, we've worked towards the worst of me, she calls out. The, the worst of her, I call out. We hold each other accountable. We look to Christ together and grow up. And it is, praise God, fruitful. I know her much more today than I did the day of our wedding because I know her more. And it's because of that that I love her greater. We are to be conformed to Christ, right? So it is in Christ. When you examine your life, are you becoming like Him? Has His nature become your nature? Is the Father pruning you in love to purge you from sin? Are you bearing fruit out of your love for Christ and His church? Jesus gives us assurance of salvation. Praise God, so many denominations cannot preach this word. Because they believe that man can lose their salvation. They believe it is up to the free will of man to come to God. Yet Jesus says in John 6, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And when God does draw them and the atoning work of Jesus is applied to their lives, their sin is removed and placed upon the cross of Christ and the righteousness of Christ is given freely to those who believe. And Jesus says in John 6, 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. It is impossible for the saved to lose their salvation. Nothing can separate us from the love that is in Christ Jesus. Nothing can snatch you out of the Father's hand. So how do I know that the precious blood of Jesus has removed my sin? How do I know that my sin has been removed as far as the east is from the west? How do I know that it's lost in a sea of forgetfulness? How do I know that Jesus' perfect righteousness has been given to my account? How do I stand blameless before a holy God? Because you will no longer be like your first father, Adam, but you will be like the true and better Adam, Christ Jesus. If you are attached to the vine, you will bear fruit, the fruit of the vine, and so proving to be a true disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is crucial that we examine our lives to see if we be in the faith. And we do have that blessed assurance as we look to Christ and see the fruit that He has brought in our lives. Verse 9 and 10, we see the promise of bountiful love. Verse 9, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. Jesus says, as the Father has loved me. And I think we have to stop right there and ask, how has the Father loved the Son? And we, John the Baptist gives us an answer back in John chapter 3 at the end of the chapter. If you remember, 
John the Baptist was baptizing and one of his disciples got into a discussion with another Jew and there was a little jealousy. They said, Jesus is on the other side of the river and everybody's going to him. And John the Baptist says, okay, hold on. Here's his words. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. But he who comes from heaven is above all. He bears witness to what he has seen and heard, yet no one receives his testimony. Whoever does receive his testimony sets his seal to this. God is true. For he whom God has sent, Jesus, utters the words of God. For he gives the Spirit without measure. Here it is. For the Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. The Father has given all things into the hand of the Son. Matthew 28, 18, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. The, the Father reveals His love for the Son and that He has placed in His hands all things, everything. Jesus says, In the same way the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Can you imagine being one of these 11 Hearing that, as the Father has loved me, so, so have I loved you. Jesus is the center of these disciples' existence. I mean, they've walked with Him and lived with Him for three years. Around the clock, they've heard and witnessed the Father's love for the Son. And He gives to them these words, So have I loved you. What comfort. Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus. How deep? Saul of Tarsus, one who yelled, crucify him. Hater of Jesus, viewed Jesus as a blasphemer, a fake, a phony Messiah, and called for his execution with the masses. After the Lord established his church in Acts, there's Stephen the deacon, a faithful servant of Jesus who is stoned to death and it is Saul who holds the garment of the man who cast the stone at God's faithful servant. Paul, Saul approved of this. But the Saul of Tarsus on his way to persecute Christians on the road to Damascus is blinded and confronted by the Lord Jesus Christ who said, Paul or Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? His eyes were opened. Jesus saved him. Listen to what Paul, Saul, says about the love of Jesus. Romans 5, 6 through 8. For while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die. But God shows His love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Next week, Pastor James will preach John 15, 13. Greater love has no one than this than someone lay down his life for his friends. Jesus says, you are my friends if you do what I command you. When we see our sin, when we see there is a vine and we're not sure if we are connected to it, and we hear the good news of Jesus looking to the cross of Christ, we see the love of the Father who sent His Son. Jesus came to the earth, holy God and holy man. He did what no man has ever done in the history of the world. Jesus lived righteously by God's standard. By God's standard, men hated him for it because they wanted to be God. So they crucified him. It was sin that crucified him. But as was prophesied in the beginning, he was resurrected after three days in the flesh. The sin that crucified him was defeated. 
As we reflect upon how the Father has loved us, the only place to look is the cross of Christ that took away the sins of those who believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ, giving to us His perfect righteousness. By faith in Him, He counts us righteous before His Father in heaven. It is only in Jesus that we can be saved. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And the only way to the Father is through Jesus. Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus. Bountiful love. As we look to the cross. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. Remain in my love. Love here is agape. It means affection, goodwill, love, benevolence. Remain in my affection. Uh, Remain in my goodwill towards you, my beloved. Remain in my love. The love of God. We cannot get our idea of love from the world. Love has been misunderstood since Genesis 3, when Eve ate of the forbidden fruit and gave it to her husband Adam and he ate of it. They were deceived into thinking they would be like God if they ate of the fruit and they stopped believing God and they started believing themselves that they could be like God. Adam brought sin into the world and with it came a misrepresentation of love. The world does not know what love is. A worldview of love is centered on self and demands its own glory. A God view of love is centered on Christ alone, causing us to bear His fruit, bringing glory to the Father. And this is an indicative. Indicative means command. It's a command to abide in the love of Jesus. So what Jesus states in verse 9, as my Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. He explains in verse 10. He says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. In verse 9, we see a comparison of the Father's love for the Son to Jesus' love for His disciples. Here we see another comparison of the disciples' keeping of Jesus' commandments as Jesus has kept His Father's commandments. This keeping of the commandments, if you will, is a doorway to bountiful love. Uh, uh, We abide in His love as we keep the commands of Jesus. So what is Jesus commanded? Right? Right? First and foremost, Matthew 22, 36 through 40. A Pharisee is trying to trick Jesus, and he says, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. We saw a few, a couple months back in John 13, verse 34, Jesus said, A new commandment I give you, that you love one another in the same way, just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. And it's by this that people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Another mark of assurance of the Christian faith. We are known by our love for one another. Jesus commands us to love the Lord God above all and to love our neighbor as ourselves. If we love ourselves more than we love our neighbor, we are in sin. This is a fruit that we all should examine in our lives. This convicts me. Do I love myself more than I love my neighbor? If we are to abide in bountiful love, we must be obedient to Jesus' commands, right? We see another command in the Great Commission. 
Jesus came and said to the disciples, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Jesus has all authority. It's been delegated to him. And with that, he says, go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Jesus commands that we go and make disciples by teaching them all that he has commanded us in his word. Jesus gives many commands. There are many commands throughout the New Testament that Jesus gives, such as loving the Lord, loving neighbor, uh, making disciples. He gives us command after command to pray, to pray. Uh, Commands here to abide. There are many commands. And, And the commands of Jesus lead us to righteousness. The commands of Jesus, they lead us to holiness. The commands of Christ are not a fence to keep us in the yard. The commands of Christ are the target that we must align our arrow to. We should be constantly examining our lives to the commands of Jesus as He makes them known to us in His Word that we may hone in on the bullseye. His commands are the target. They're our aim. The promise of bountiful love is to those who keep the commandments of Jesus. He says, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love, as sure as the Father loves the Son, and as sure as Jesus was faithful to fulfill all that the Father had set before Him, so surely will we abide in the love of Jesus as the Holy Spirit leads us in obedience to Christ. We have the promise of bountiful love. And the last thing we see is the promise of great joy. Verse 11, These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. These things I have spoken to you. The words of Jesus bring the fullness of joy to those who have ears to hear. These things I have spoken to you. What things is Jesus talking about? He's talking about the word picture. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, He takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, He prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you. Jesus gives to His disciples these words at a crucial time when they know He is about to depart. Their emotions are everywhere, I imagine. They're wrecked. And Jesus comforts them and gives them many promises amongst of which is His joy. His joy. The word joy here is, in Greek is kara, and it means gladness. His gladness. What does Jesus' joy look like? We see a picture of this in Luke 10, 21. Jesus says in that same hour, He rejoiced. He kara. He had joy. 
He rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to the little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. Jesus rejoices. Kara, he rejoices in the Spirit, giving thanks to the Father that he has hidden the light from the wise, those who do not believe, and revealed the beauty of the gospel to those who rely upon Jesus as a little child. Just like my little boys over there rely on their dad fully. We rely on Jesus in the same manner. Jesus finds great joy in the Father's gracious will towards, towards us whom He saves. We see His joy in Luke 15, 5-7. through 7. And then the parable of the lost sheep, the lost sheep that went away. He says, when he found it, he lays it on his shoulder rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors saying to them, rejoice, have joy with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I tell you the same way. There will be more joy, Kara, in heaven over one sinner who repents than over the 99 righteous people who need no repentance. We have Jesus' joy. Here's one more. I'm almost finished. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin that clings so closely. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of our faith, who for joy, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. It was Jesus' joy, the, the joy that he had caused him to endure the cross as His joy in us causes us to endure the sufferings that we have to endure in this, in this life. He despised the shame and He is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus says that my joy be in you and that your joy may be full. To those who truly hear this word and through it He gives you His joy that becomes your joy that becomes full. Jesus is seated at the right hand of the throne of God, and Paul says in Ephesians 2 that we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. Our joy is in the promise of eternal life, that which Jesus came to secure for sinful men who would believe Him, who would abide in Him, who would endure the pruning knife of the Word by the Father's hand, those who would bear fruit, more fruit, and much fruit. To us, Jesus has given the promise of eternal life with Him. Would you look to Jesus? You know this Jesus? Or believe on Him. If He is calling you, believe on Him. There may not be another hour. Believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ that you might be saved. Turn from your sin. That you may grow in the grace and knowledge of, of the God who saves. And would you boldly pray and ask the Father to prune you? Would you ask Him to do whatever it takes to cause you to bear fruit, whether it brings affliction or not? Because that is a prayer that Jesus promises to answer. The Father is glorified in the fruit bearing of Christ's branches. As we, the branches, receive from Christ's words, like, like sap of the vine that feeds the branches, His Word becomes our target. His Word becomes our aim and our focus. As a branch, we take the life that comes from Christ to us and it changes us on the inside. Because of His life, because of His Word, we bear fruit on the outside. Our joy 
is full because he has given us his joy. It becomes our joy. And it is a great joy because it is overflowing. It is full. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that you have shown us your holiness, that you are just, perfectly righteous, holy, good. All your ways are good, O oh God. And in your love, you have grafted us in to the true vine, Jesus Christ. You have given us the faith to do so. You have caused us to believe because of your Holy Spirit. Lord, help us to pray, abiding in you your word abiding in us. Show us the assurance we have in Christ because of the fruit he causes us to bear by the word. As the word penetrates our, our being, as we conform to, to Jesus like a, like a husband and a wife conform to one another, as we take upon your nature as your word comes and makes war with sin in our lives and defeats it, and we grow in grace. May we bear more fruit. All to the praise of your glory. All for the sake of your name and your remembrance. It's in your precious name we pray, Jesus. Amen.